I'd like to welcome everyone to DAT's webinar today, Long Live the RFP, How to Bid with Confidence in the New Norm. My name is Randy Kobach and I am part of the marketing team here at DAT and I'm excited because what you can expect today is a very lively conversation and hopefully some nuggets you can take back with you after the with that I'm going to talk through the agenda so you know what to expect this morning uh, after I'm done talking I'm going to hand it over to our panel today and they'll do their introductions and we're going to start out with setting the stage and what we mean by that we're going to be looking back and looking forward so let's just make sure we're all on the same page and recognizing where the business has been and then we're going to do a demo but before we get the demo we have a little bit of a teaser because we've been working here at DAT on this new RFP tool and we just want to give you an idea of what you can expect in the coming months when this product goes live and then we'll go into Q&A and with that I'd like to hand the mic over to our moderator today Eric Williams and everyone can do their introductions thank you so much Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're at. I'm very happy that you've taken the time out of your busy day to come join us. Um, I'm hoping that uh, with the uh, industry experts we have on the panel today, um, you'll actually get some benefit for your time. So I'm Eric Williams. I'm a senior program manager here at DAT. Um, if there's a job in the industry or a seat, I've probably sat in it at one point or uh, helped train somebody on how to do that. Um, so Brad, do you want to introduce yourself? Pleasure. Uh, I'm Brad Loeb. I'm the Vice President of Pricing and Analytics over uh, Armstrong Transport. I've uh, been in the industry a little over 12 years now, and uh, I've also done a variety of uh, positions uh, from uh, working for an asset company, uh, shipper, and now broker. Thank you, Brad. I'm very happy to be with you today, and I, I uh, am really excited to uh, kind of pick your brain on some of these topics today. Andrew? Hi, Eric. Like Brad, I've been in the industry about 12 years now. I've been with Circle Logistics as a VP um, for about nine years. I manage four of our 12 offices, about $250 million in truckload freight brokerage. And as we've grown over the years, I've played just about every role in the truckload freight brokerage that one can. Yeah, and I'm really excited um, to hear your perspective on how to sell some of this stuff because uh, oftentimes you have to align your pricing and uh, selling strategies together. And since you have that uh, P&L responsibility, I think you'll have a, a really unique viewpoint today. Um, and then Miles, uh, you're going to be helping us out with a, a demo of uh, DAT rate cast. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Andrew and Brad, for your time and joining us. Hopefully, I look familiar to some of you in the audience. I may be your sales rep at DAT. I've uh, been in the industry since my days at FreightQuote.com back in 2015, um, but I'm excited to show you RateCast. I think there's a lot of traction with the tool right now and uh, just a ton of benefit behind it. So I'm excited for this conversation too. All right. Um, you guys all want to jump in? Um, I think it's always important to start these conversations with a little bit of historical reference. Um, Randy, if you could pull up the next slide. Um, so this is one of the uh, the coolest views that I've seen, um, and I want to do, give a shout out to Tamir Dov, who is one of our product managers who's uh, developing the RFP tool that we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and it uh, kind of highlights some of the uh, the cool data that, uh, that we have at DAT. Um, but what you're looking at here is um, the gray line there is historical spot, the gold line is existing contract, and the blue line is new contract. The uh, bars on the bottom, uh, represent the average length of current contracts. So um, as we look at this, and we've uh, put in some historical reference points for you, so some of you guys out there who've na been navigating this market for a while, uh, these probably look very familiar to you, um, and the market results uh, should um, maybe bring back some good or bad memories. Um, but what we're currently experiencing is the longest period of rate inflation ever. Um, we're also experiencing the greatest magnitude in rate inflation ever. Um, and we're also looking at the average contract rate decreasing um, due to the rate volatility. Um, we'll probably get into this conversation and talk about mini bids and quarterly bids and things like that, which are certainly having an influence. But I think it's really interesting that um, we've fallen from 357 days, which was kind of the peak in that 2016, 2017 timeframe. Um, I know a lot of shippers were asking for, for two-year contracts during that timeframe, down to 191 days. 
Um, and then the other thing that I want to draw your attention to is the delta or spread between that gold line and that blue line. Um, that's a record in the contract resets. So if you have existing contracts where, like if you're thinking of the concept of skate to where the puck is going, um, Mark continues to just kind of get this wrong. Like spots kind of hanging out with that existing uh, contract rate. But every time we have a reset, um, it uh, is jumping significantly more. So I think um, the uh, the data that we put, put out most recently from the FMIC side for shippers is contract resets are right around 18% year over year, um, which is pretty significant. So um, what I wanna talk about, as you can see from this chart is there's one market and then there's this new market. So there's kind of been this historical shift. We can talk a little bit about the capacity, but we're not gonna do that um, for this particular show. But what I wanna talk about is kind of how the strategies have changed in that uh, 2014, 2016, 17, 18 period to where we're at now. Um, so if you can go to kind of go to the, uh, the the next slide there, Randy. And this is kind of a, th that look back that we're talking about. So um, Andrew, if you wanna kind of talk about, think back to 2016, 17 and how you were participating in RFPs, um, Maybe kind of talk a little bit about your sell strategy, but then also if you can align that with um, some of your pricing strategies back in 2017 to kind of set where Circle's been, and then we'll talk a little bit about where you're going. Hey, you know, we've had about 100% growth every year I've been here in the last nine years. And so our RFP strategy has constantly evolved and matured and, and changed. And um, you know, back in 2016, 2017, you know, a lot of it was very much a, a manual process for us. Um, we use multi-lane, but I don't think we were heavily reliant on our own data. And I don't know that we collaborated across departments maybe as well as we should. And I think the other thing is, you know, it's, it's, it's very important to collaborate across departments, but it's also just as important to know when not to collaborate across departments when you're a larger organization with a carrier desk and a customer desk there's sometimes when maybe the sales guys know more and sometimes where maybe the pricing guys know more and so um not treating i think we used to treat every rfp like it was the same and ultimately through that learning process what we found out is a lot of shippers look at or analyze their rates very differently mm -hmm. uh, i'll never forget there's a shipper out there with 500 million dollars in annual freight spend i worked with that would take your average rf uh, average rate per mile across all lanes that you bid regardless of volume and that's how <laughs> it would decide if you give them a good rate and so that was a big eye opener for us where we really needed to learn what was going on on the analyzation side of mm -hmm. these rfps that we were submitting and we needed to tweak our strategy based on how our customer was really, truly going to look at them. And so I think now there's much more collaborative process as far as, okay, is there going to be one round, two rounds, three rounds? Mm -hmm. is, is the shipper going to surprise us with a second or third round? Have they done that in the past? Um, and I think so those, that experience and, and learning and tweaking the process has really helped us evolve. So Andrew, uh, real quick on on that uh, $500 million shipper that you mentioned, uh, I've certainly ran into that. Um, did that kind of inform you that maybe for certain shippers, you, you don't want to bid everything and you should maybe uh, kind of focus uh, more on where your core competencies are? Um, it, was that like an eye opener that helped you? Uh, it, it was think huge about that? for us. And I remember thinking, oh, well, we could have just not quoted everything to Western Canada and our rates would have looked lower, right? right. Um, the big thing that came out of that from us, and I think our mantra here at Circle about uh, to our piece, um, is quote fast and quote often. And because at the end of the day, you don't know how they're looking for at rates on the other side of things. And um, you know, when, when occasionally we'll, we'll say, oh, should we put, you know, 18% margin or 19% margin on this? And when we get down to those fine two details, I remind everybody, quote fast and quote often, because it might not matter. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, so Andrew, you mentioned a, a little bit about um, collaboration. And when I think about that, I'm, I'm thinking about bid reviews. And I can remember sitting in the seat going through bid reviews, uh, maybe with my carrier sales managers and the account manager. And we come upon a lane um, called Mem maybe like Memphis to Nashville. And, and we start thinking about, well, I think so-and-so has a uh, has a carrier for that. Um, and then that would kind of lead us to stop 
our review process, maybe run out to the floor and invite them in and, and to kind of talk about that. Brad, um, I'd love to hear a little bit maybe about the evolution of how you guys manage risk, how you conduct bid reviews, um, how you did it, and maybe what you've learned and kind of where you're at now in that process. Yeah, so just like with Andrew, our, our evolution has been pretty significant over the last five years uh, from 2017 to now. Um, in 2017, I think most people are pricing off of historical numbers. Uh, most people, you know, you could you could see what you did last year and predict what you're gonna do this year. Um, and until very recently, that was a, a very viable strategy that we could do. Uh, we could say, you know, we think the market's going to go up 5% this year. It's going to go down 5%, whatever it was. And then just, just kind of look at that over a larger picture. Um, versus now, it, it's not the case. Now, it, it, the volatility of the market is so much larger that, you know, a single lane, I mean, we have cross-country lanes that swing two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 even um, over the course of a year. Uh, and you can't just look at it and say, well, I paid this last year. I'm going to pay this this year. Uh, and so we have to we have to go more in depth into data uh, analytics than we did in the past. But in the past, we could say, well, we had a carrier carrier runs it at this much, and um, that should be about market. And we can even if we have to expand that lane outside that carrier, we can probably lock someone in at that rate. And now it's um, it is much more. We have to look at a broader picture on on every single RP and every single customer that we that we look at. We actually have to go into a specific game plan for that customer on how are we going to grow with them, where do we want to grow with them, and where do we fit in with their network. Um, um, th so go ahead. Please. No, um, I I I can't help but uh, but think as as you're learning these things um, in terms of. I need to be more analytical here. I need to look at my carrier usage on this lane. I can't continue to um, extrapolate that um, all carriers will behave like this. Um, from all that data collection and starting to use your internal data, and Andrew, you, you kind of mentioned that post or previous, you, you weren't really bringing that in. So um, I maybe want to pivot the conversation a little bit to what types of internal data um, are you guys now looking at that you weren't looking at in, in 2017? So we've gone in even so granular to look at what day of the week do we cover best at? What time of the day are we covering best at? Uh, it, you know, we've noticed uh, historically in the last two years, it's been much more difficult. Uh, Thursdays are more expensive day by far, right? Uh, it's the day where we typically have those, anything but those one day transits or the yep. long haul transits, uh, we, we pay extra. So we have to look at even, you know, what day of the week is this typically moving? Uh, and then we try and give recommendations even of what time of the day do we recommend covering the, the, mm -hmm. the freight at. Um, the, that's how granular we've gone into to try and get the, the best, you know, service and the best bang for our buck. Um, we've looked at, you know, where we see the most drop-offs. So if we cover freight, where's our carrier dropping off the most and we're having mm -hmm. to recover. Um, we give shippers and receiver scorecards for, and that, that's all included on there as well, mm -hmm. so that we can make sure that, you know, we're prepared for uh, as many scenarios as possible, because right now with the volatility that it is, you know, if I cover something during the prime time of the day when I get my best rate versus the worst time, um, it's a significant difference. And so it can change from a, a positive lane into a negative lane very, very quickly. Absolutely. Andrew, um, this some of that resonate with you in terms of uh, using internal data to uh, to help inform your reps on uh, some of the decision making, uh, almost creating decision trees for them. Yeah, we we've looked at a lot of the similar data Brad's looked at, and I remember one thing that stuck out to me in particular is uh, Houston. There, there's the most available capacity on Mondays and the least amount on Tuesdays, and then it gradually scales up throughout the week. And and what we kind of realized is there's not really much within other major metros outside of you know Texas within mm -hmm. 500 miles, and so trucks are landing there on Monday from their long haul over the weekend, and so. We've been able to take that data and say, okay, with well, shippers that are shipping outbound to Houston and we have flexibility, whether we could pick up on Monday or Tuesday, mm -hmm. we probably have some room uh, to work with them on the rate, but shippers who are more or less flexible and by appointment, we've, so it, it really comes down to, again, working with the sales team for us on what flexibility we could take based on the data we found. I think one of the number one things that we found that's brought us, data, us impact is, 
actually reaching out to the shippers and the decision makers at the RFP process and saying, mm -hmm. hey, we bid on 30% of your RFP, but this 2% of your RFP, it's just 20 lanes. And here they are. We actually are already doing those 25 times a day um, and showing them that data yep. and being able to find those lane, lane synergies has been really key. It also proves very valuable. Drop trailers have been a big area. I know that brokers have grown into in the last couple of years. And um, if you're looking at a big retailer who's got drop trailers everywhere that they want and drop trailer lanes, match them up to what you have and mm -hmm. show them, hey, we can do this. Or sometimes you can find that if you win a lane from the RFP, you can go back to another customer that has that same uh, the, the same bat head hauls and back hauls, and now you've got twice the amount of business. No, I love that. Um, so I just I just want to ask to be clear, how much of this analytics was it, were you guys doing in 2017? Almost none. I hate to say it. Uh, so um, <laughs> right. we we Armstrong. Uh, I think Andrew kind of mentioned that Circle did this, but Armstrong was doing a very much where um, back in the day. A lot of a lot of salespeople were were putting their own freight. Yeah, uh, for sure. And, mm -hmm. and so it was um, it was very it, it was less analytical, more emotional uh, driven. Uh, you know, this is what I want. This is what you know I think it should be. Versus this is what the data says. This is what the data thinks mm -hmm. it should be. Uh, and it's it's been a it's been a change in Armstrong on, on taking out some of that emotional aspect of you know it's not it's it's our it's not my customer in a sense uh, that. I'm not dealing with that customer every day. Um, so I can look at it, this is what the numbers say, and then make those adjustments based on the, the feedback of the carrier team and the sales team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we, we try and make a game plan for every individual RFP that we do uh, and make those adjustments, but it is much more data-driven now than it was historically. No, I think that makes uh, perfect sense. Um, I certainly maybe had some of these things top of mind and things that I could track. Um, I definitely was not doing that. Um, so I, I think this is a nice place for us to pivot into or to summarize um, how we used to do it. I heard very manual, that definitely resonates, poor collaboration or in some cases too much collaboration. Um, using historical data versus using predictive data, um, not relying on your own data. Maybe it's because you didn't have enough density or didn't quite know how to use it or what you wanted to, uh, to look at, um, how to account for seasonality, um, and then how to even account for um, days of the week and appointment times and, and things like that. So I think if, if we think about where we were as an industry and like just pause for a second, we all went through it to where we're at now, it's pretty incredible. Um, and Randy, if you want to move into the next slide, I, I kind of want to talk a little bit more about um, how we went through this, had some of these learnings, and then maybe talk about, and you guys have hinted at how you've had some process changes, but um, Randy, if you could grab the next slide. Um, I'd love to, and I know Brad, um, when we spoke, you've been working on actually building a tool. Um, and, and my assumption is there's probably some target lanes in there. Um, there's specific uh, laneway or specific um, commodities, maybe some uh, appointment times or verticals that kind of go in there. Um, could you uh, maybe talk a little bit about some of the work that you did that um, you've now taken that tribal knowledge approach and have maybe uh, crafted that into more of a tool so that when you have a new rep come on, um, they don't have to talk to Andrew, Brad, Eric, Miles, like it's actually already built there for a tool. Yeah, so we're we're building a, a pricing tool that we're rolling out to every individual person within Armstrong. Um, it is, it's still in the building process, but um, what we're doing is we're uh, pretty much consolidating all the market data that I look at into one place, weighing, weighing it, and then spitting out a number to our, our front end reps. Andrew mentioned, you know, like where it's quote fast, quote often. Uh, the goal is to, to, you know, capitalize as much as we can on, on the speed of quoting for, you know, that spot freight, uh, and then being able to give that front end user the information to know when it's best to lock in that truck versus just keep working it and try and get a better rate. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's two stages of the tool that we're building. One is for the spot function, one is for the RP function. And um, it's pretty much using, um, we're, we're buying data and then using internal data to, to build uh, this 
system that will pretty much weigh all the averages and all the all the means that we want to put out numbers of recommendation for rates with a confidence score attached to it. Um, and, and we're doing that. It's 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 become so looking forward where we're at right rates now versus before is you have to be more of a industry expert and economic expert even to to under to try and guess where rates are going to go in the next month six months year uh and i know i've learned more about um what our how our economy works and what it's doing in the last few years than i ever had to worry about at the beginning of my career uh and so you know, we can't expect every person to do that. So mm -hmm. the goal is to be able to consolidate that knowledge into one place and be able to distribute it to our individual users. That's incredibly exciting um, and a lot of work. So I, and, and I'm sure you're gonna continue to iterate on that. Um, Andrew, I wanna go back to this, this concept of quote fast and quote often. Um, it's a tried and true strategy. Um, it, it certainly works, um, but it requires a significant amount of education and by that like you have to go to your customers and educate them on why you're doing that um could you talk a little bit about um how you talk to your shippers about why this particular lane needs this type of strategy versus maybe like a a dallas to memphis where you've got drop trailers on both ends um how do you educate the shipper to to know the difference in their network and how um a more dynamic pricing strategy is probably um not punitive to them, but it actually works in their favor. Yeah, I think ultimately, if you're doing rates with your shipper more often than they come to you and ask you to do them, you're, I think you're winning, right? And, and if you can get them to agree to, hey, maybe you can update these 10 lanes, right? No one wants to go, and most shippers that I know, they update their um, databases with your contract rates manually. And so even if you have a new RFP, they still go in line by line and put them all in. They don't want to be bothered with 300 or 500 or more rates they have to update. It, it, typically, we found the 80-20 rule applies that 80% of our volume or revenue we, uh, from a shipper comes on 20% of the lanes, right? So um, go to them with those 20% those of those small few lanes and say, hey, these aren't working anymore, right? It's changed because... The price of oil has gone up and, you know, Texas is hot again for flatbed or it's produce season or we've had a slow um, start to the year and out of Florida. You know, give them those actual reasons. I think this is why we're not just relying on the multi-lane, but using the UI for some specific pointed lanes, right? Um, a lot of lanes represent a very good average, but one lane can be an outlier. And yeah. so... You should you should decide what lanes you actually really want to zone in on and take a look at those and then you know look at your load to truck ratios look at your market uh, conditions index you know Brad talked about having everything in one place having a TMS provider who's very flexible and adaptable and willing to do new things I think is extremely important we've been very lucky with our TMS provider and we've built in. Um, some dynamic rating tools, that, some forecasting tools. We're bringing in like load board rates and max buy based on DAT averages uh, mm -hmm. plus our own lane history. And those are all fluid. They're being updated every single yep. day automatically um, without having a person having to go in and, and do that. And so I think being able to get all these in one place has been extremely important. Um, incredible points. Um... I, I love that idea of, of bringing in and kind of setting the max buy based off the market versus maybe a rep setting it off of where their commission number would be. Um, I, I think it, it holds your uh, your reps to, to be more true in the marketplace and, and you don't end up with the uh, the instance where you might have a high volume lane that, that you have good money in and it kind of raises the uh, the rate for your brokerage on that entire laneway because you're gonna have other shippers that share the corridor. Um, so I, I love that approach. Um, I do have a, a one question um, and kind of relates to seasonality um as as we showed at the the top in the in the slide that um the average contract is is down to like 190 days and andrew you're talking about um going back to your shipper more often for for updates and and you think that that uh is a unique value prop to you and it helps you win um because you're having to submit rates or update rates more frequently in different portions of the year um, that doesn't that don't align with kind of that historical RFP schedule. How do you guys account for uh, for seasonality? 
um, like, do you have any predictive analytics or um, in-house analytics that uh, that you're using that that help you identify which lanes are seasonal and uh, to what degree? Um, and either of you can take that question. I, I'd, I'd love to hear from both of you. Uh, I get, I'll start. Um, so we do use predictive analytics to to work with seasonality. Um, I mean, thankfully, with most produce seasons, they're pretty consistent. It's just a matter of then a couple of weeks of depending on weather when they're going to start. Uh, for instance, you know, we're, we're coming up where you must start to slow down. Uh, and so, you know, in the next two to three weeks, we're expecting California, Salinas area to especially pick up. Uh, Florida, you know, the Georgias are starting to go up, up right now, but they're a little bit slower than normal because of weather. So, you know, with produce, we're, we're able to do it on a larger regional level. Um, with general markets, we're, uh, we're able to do it on a larger regional level. And so we try and teach um, our, our pricing teams, you know, before they're able to work on long-term RPs, these, these general trends to watch out for. Um, we also make sure we have weekly meetings that we talk about the change in the markets, um, what's coming up, what's happening right now. Uh, and we work with that on a, on a weekly basis every week. Um, those are typically how we try and handle it. Uh, the predictive analytics is important. I mean, we definitely for sure use the Raycast tool to help us with that. It'll help, you know, uh, obviously, you know, you guys have more an analysts than we do. So using your team to, to help predict when that's gonna happen more closely helps. Uh, and then we, we combine that with our own data and knowledge to confirm or adjust off of your numbers. Got it, thank you. Um, Andrew, how do you uh, kind of account for seasonality? You know, if I can shamelessly plug your uh, forecasting tool I here, I all. will. Um, <laughs> we, you know, we used to go back and do the 12 month spit out on the multi lane and yep. say, okay, what was it during this period of time last year, maybe even the year before? And I know if, if you reach out to the DAT, then maybe sometimes they're willing to provide you more historical data. And, and we've mm -hmm. done that from time to time, especially on, on big produce season wins. Although I think in the last two years, a lot of seasonality has been flipped up side of 10 and for sure. that's why I don't think we're really doing that anymore. And we, this is where I would plug the forecasting tool because I know you guys plug in a lot of other variables beyond history and what's mm -hmm. going on in the current market. And so that's where I, I think we're probably pretty heavily relying on um, the data that we're, we're paying you guys to provide us with. So uh, I'll jump on top of Andrew, what he said there is we've actually had to add a line into our, our data for literally just, an, it's an adjustment column. And so okay. we literally had to add that in because of the current market and how it's going. And, and it technically can adjust up or down, mostly it's going up, you know, until very, very recently. Um, and that's allowed us to help be a little more flexible with that as well. Got it. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. And uh, I, I, I want to talk about key success factors um, because it, it's one thing to uh, do all this analytics. Um, at the end of the day, like there's a profit motive behind all of this. So, Andrew, um, you run a, a significant uh, P and L, um, so that kind of puts you in a in a u unique position um, where you're kind of thinking about pricing, procurements, sales, account management, um, all at the same time. Um, what does a successful RFP look like to you? You know, one of my mentors told me a couple of years ago, um, he said, you know, you know, when you're no longer a startup, when the life cycle of your employees no longer dictates the life cycle of your sales process. And I, I thought it was really interesting because as we, my office has gone from 20 to 200 people in the last nine years, there was a time where my keys to success were certain individuals and um, and their ability to um, maybe a young guy fresh out of college with a finance degree and maybe a sleeping problem who can knock out an RP at two in the morning. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that these days um, it, it really comes down for us, it comes down to process and defining your process and having it written down on paper. And for us, it's making sure that not one key individual is a part of that success and that we have a proper process where everybody in every department knows what to do, when to do it, who to involve and how to approach it. And and if any at point in time that process is broken or there's a chink in, in the chain, to come to management and say, hey, what, we, what should we do? And, and two people came to my office today and said, hey, <laughs> the process is broken a little bit. We have a disagreement on how to move forward. What do you think? And I think it's just around 
having a group that's of people involved in the process that all want to be successful, that are all moving in the same direction and fast is ultimately the keys to, to the success from my perspective. I'm sure Brad has a very different perspective from an analytical point of view, but from my perspective as a manager and a leader, I think that's the most important factor is having people who are on the same page and want to win. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Brad, I, I am curious on, on your opinion. Um, what, what do you consider to be a successful RFP? Uh, so I kind of mentioned that we we have a, a goal before we start every RFP and we, we look at that particular customer and depending on where that customer is in our network, um, that it, there's the different goals for every single one. If it's a new customer, sometimes the, a successful RP can just be getting a lane. Yeah. Right. Uh, just getting in the door, getting a lane, getting moving, showing what we can do and how we can help that customer. Mm -hmm. um, for other customers, it can be, uh, you know, is it a growth customer? Is it this customer we want to grow with? Uh, is it a customer that we have a lot of freight with, but we need to be more profitable? Um, it, you know, is it so each individual customer we look at, uh, and if we can hit that goal, that's a successful RFP for us. Um, so, you know, for new customers, do we get in with that customer? Do we get the lanes that we are shooting for or a lane that we are shooting for? Uh, and that opens up, you know, the spot network for us and opens up future, you know, growth. Um, is it a customer where, you know, historically, you know, because maybe we underbid it, um, you know, we don't, we don't rego negotiate a, a contracted lane. So maybe we underbid it the year before mm -hmm. and we need to, we need to up our profitability with them. You know, can we maintain the level of business that we've been doing while upping profitability to the level that we need it at? Um, and, you know, or is it, you know, maybe we just want volume, you know, sometimes, sometimes volume speaks words and uh, it's, you know, depending on the company strategy and that individual customer, um, that's, that's, that's the successful RFP for me is, you know, did we hit our goal going into it? I, uh, I, I love that perspective as well. Um, so I, um, I, I kind of want to, before we uh, move into Miles uh, walking us through some Raycast examples, um, predictions for, for 2022. Um, I know the, uh, the, the market has softened a little bit, um, fuel exploded. Um, so there's some pressure on line all. So maybe the comps are, are a little muddy right now as we're looking through those. But um, Andrew, how do you think the rest of the year is gonna shake out? I think we're going to see a lot of softening across the board with, with, in reefer and the drive-in space. I think the flatbed space still has a lot of room for contract rates to run up a bit. Um, November and December, I talked to some of my leaders and, and our, our data folks, and I said, hey, let, let's really price very aggressively, especially with new business going into 2022. And they kind of looked at me like, it's not been like that. I think you're kind of crazy. And then quarter one happened and things continued to go up and I did look crazy. Um, but I think it's starting to, to come through now some of the weather and, you know, existential global events uh, that have been going on are kind of simmering down a little bit in the market. Um, I think that we're going to see a lot of softening uh, in the environment. One thing I think to look out for is there's a lot of new trucking companies out there who yes. have higher baseline costs than yep. folks have been in the market longer. They may not be able to weather um, you know, increased, decreased rates with increased fuel costs. And I think it's something to keep an eye on because even if rates go down, I think things might still be strong in the brokerage environment because we've seen this shift in capacity from the big national carriers to yep. small carriers who only get their capacity. Now, the only thing I think the caveat to, to that would be do some of these drivers, if their companies fall apart, go back to the large national right, carriers. Right, right. Yep. So a lot of different factors to consider, but overall, I think we're going to see uh, some decrease in the drive-in and reefer space. So so what I heard there is um, pick your uh, high revenue lanes, um, take a risk, and uh, understand that you may have some margin expansion. Um, Brad, what's your crystal ball say? Uh, we're, we're, we're predicting fairly similar to what Andrew's saying, a little bit different, um, but fairly similar. We expect flatbed to continue to go up. Um, but with the vein and reefer markets, we do expect them, we expect them to continue to go down probably for the end of the month, uh, through most of April and mm -hmm. then summer, we expect it to rebound a little bit. Yeah. Um, the difference this year is though, we do expect Q4 to start seeing rates go back down. We predicted 
even at the beginning of the year before this started happening, that we were going to see Q3, Q4 rates start to go back down and normalize a little bit. The, the only caveat I have to say with Andrew is um, our base rates are higher than they were year over year because yeah. of costs, right? So Andrew kind of touched on it a little bit. And we're look, we don't expect rates to ever get back to where they were completely, you know, in 2017, 2018 Correct. because of that. Yeah. Um, it just the, the the cost of operating a truck now is higher than it has ever been, uh, and we don't see that changing. Yeah. So yes, there's room to go down. The rates uh, I think went higher than they probably should have, especially in January uh, and over in, in last Q4. Um, and so there there's room to go down. And we're starting to see that, but yep. um, we are expecting the summer rates to tick back up a little bit and then hopefully go back. Yeah, and I, I want to point out, guys. Um, for, for everyone in the audience, um, 240 a mile is still very, very high. Um, so when we start talking about cost structures resetting, um, there's probably still room for driver pay to increase and, and there's still room for line hauls to drop and uh, not have uh, catastrophe. So um, I, I think it's important to, uh, to do that and then we'll kind of see how things play out from there. Um, well, I, I really appreciate um, learning about your business and your evolution. And um, I, I really appreciate you guys sharing your learnings along with that. Um, Randy, if you want to go to the next slide, um, and I don't know who all is going to be at TIA. Um, if you are there, um, I will be speaking on a panel with Tamir Dov, our product manager who's developed this tool. Um, but I kind of want to give you a sneak peek. We do have an RFP response tool that is coming to market. Um, it's going to help you essentially kind of get you out of spreadsheets and get you into a um, better environment. So you'll be able to normalize uh, your bid file, bring that into a, a DAT standard file, um, upload that into the pricing tool, set your margins um, based upon where you want to use, like if you want to use the uh, the DAT high, the mid or the low, you can do that and you can set dynamic margins in there. With your min max, um, you can, if you're a contributor to uh, rate view, you can uh, pull in your own rates into the UI. Um, so there's a lot of really cool things going on there um, and that tool will continue to iterate. So it'll um, initially, we're probably gonna bundle it up with our rate cast tool, um, but stop by the, uh, the booth during TIA on Friday and um, love to uh, talk more about it with everybody. Um, and with that, um, Randy, do you wanna give control to, uh, to Miles so he can kind of run us through rate cast? Okay, Miles, you're showing your should. Uh, okay, we can see your screen, perfect. Perfect. <clears throat> All right, well, Miles is pulling that up. For uh, for those of you that do not know what Ratecast is, it is a forecasting tool. One of the uh, things about a forecasting tool is it requires an enormous amount of historical data because you have to uh, look at past behavior so that you can predict the future. Ratecast has roughly half a trillion dollars in freight spend that goes into it. Um, so for those of you who uh, have wanted to uh, to call DAT and um, maybe build out your own seasonal model or purchase a bunch of data, um, I'd point you in the direction of Raycast first because we've kind of already done that for you. Um, and we've added some uh, some additional uh, uh, variables into that that, uh, that we think are, are pretty important. Um, so Miles, what are we looking at here? So what we're looking at right now is what everybody's used to seeing, and we've talked about 2017 a little bit on this call. This is what you would have been using in 2017 to probably come up with the price. You're gonna be using rate view history, and uh, kind of what Brad was talking about, and even Andrew, he said, you gotta quote fast, you gotta quote often. Um, this is why I work at DAT, because I love rate view, and I had no clue about rate cast when I started working here. So this is what I knew and was able to make money with, but right now in the last two years, I think it'd be a little bit, um, not necessarily dangerous, but you gotta be careful with when you're going back and looking at history from a year ago. Um, even we can see February is much different than it was last year. And if you can't see, that's about $500 difference on the slang. But what I really wanted to show you is what Brad was talking about is day of the week really matters. And he, brought, he talked about Houston. So what we're looking at here is tomorrow is Wednesday. 
he was talking about how Thursday seems to be higher than Friday, and then Monday seems to be lower, and then Tuesday gets more expensive. This really yep. shows you that in the tool. So if I'm yep. brand new to the industry and I've never quoted a lane before, and Brad's telling me kind of from a high level pricing view, watch out for Tuesday, watch out for Thursday, this I can see. So sometimes just seeing it is very powerful. Um, so I don't know, Brad, do you ever direct like new users to look at this and kind of explain it that way? Or how do you use so, the actual UI with your pricing analysis too? Um, we, we keep Raycast to a, a higher level right now just because it is it can get a little confusing. Um, but we do use it within the pricing team every day. Uh, and we do use it, especially in the spot market, to look at the, the five-day forecast, uh, the eight-day forecast, um, when we have, you know, and um, adjust based on what we expect daily volumes to be like. Um, so it, it's it's one of the tools that we use on a daily basis on every single load, uh, and we do look at it like that, or where you're just explaining where you know is today going to be more expensive than tomorrow, or uh, vice versa. Yeah. It matters, this, right? This one is fifteen hundred and fifty miles, roughly. If it changes five cents, that's that matters. Um, my margin's either gone or it's not as much as I'd like it to be. And uh, you can also look in the old UI. We're going to look at the new UI. This is showing you the trend line for the next year. I really like looking in the new um, version. So as DAT rolls out new products, they're going to kind of start looking more and more like this. And I think this is a cool feature right off the bat. These are the lanes I've been looking at this morning. So I, I've searched these lanes um, either yesterday, previously, you can kind of see the dates here. So I know when I looked at them, um, the RFP tool that Eric mentioned, he'll be showing at TIA alongside with me in San Diego next week is similar to this, um, but you'd be able to kind of click in here, manipulate this rate a little bit and make it yours. So I'm just gonna jump into, we kind of talked about produce a little bit. I'm on Fresno, California, going into Dallas. So we should start seeing produce start to move. It's about that time. I can't remember if it was Andrew or Brad that mentioned within a week or two, we typically see produce season start. So we can look at this a couple different ways. You're going, well, this looks like I'm about to book a flight with Southwest or something like that, where we're seeing the rates presented to us in a calendar view. So a quick scan of your eyes can tell you, if we just look at tomorrow, 220, 231, 235, 239. It looks like rates are gonna start coming up. Why is that? Likely there's more produce moving. Yep. Um, Miles, can you show the uh, the timeline view there as well? Yeah. Yeah. So we had a couple different views. We were looking at the eight day view in the old UI. So same thing here. If I'm Brad or Andrew, I'm sounding the alarm right now because I'm watching this go up and I know it's not gonna stop for at least a couple weeks. So we were talking as a sales team this morning, are our customers able to pivot fast enough? Because when I was a broker, there's nothing worse coming in tomorrow thinking you're gonna make $500 on a load and end up losing money or something like that because you didn't attribute or maybe this Thursday is when you really start to feel it. Or maybe this Friday, everyone's got a load that's taken them out of California and there's not much left so they, they can name their price, right? And you don't wanna be in that position. So I'm trying to grab this right now. I'm not trying to wait till next week. Um, over the next 35 days, I really like kind of progressing how I look at this. This is not showing us any sort of don't do anything crazy, Miles. I always used to like to push the limit and try and buy better. This would tell me not to do that um, and be prepared for rates to keep going up. Um, Andrew, Brad, do you want to throw out a date when you suspect this to go down that we'll look at next? Eric's got his hand up. We, we can all take a guess. <laughs> Fourth of July. When, 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 when I'll start going down again? So yeah. I, guess. I mean, we don't, I don't expect it to go down until probably after August. I'm going to go with 4th of July. These holidays are good guesses, right? So let's see. 52 weeks is going to show us the year view. Brad, 
and area curve correct, right? Going all the way up, here's the 4th of July. We're seeing a little bit of a lull, but we're never really coming back down to where we were. Right. And then of course we got Thanksgiving and the holidays and then, you know, maybe right here is when everybody kind of goes home and there's not as much capacity. So we get a little bit higher rates for a couple of weeks and then everybody comes back to work and rates are a little bit low. So why does that look like that? Well, we've got about five and a half, six years of data in there and Eric, you threw out that trillion dollar number, right? So that allows us to predict what's gonna be coming. And it's not just a prediction. Andrew touched on it earlier. What happens in rate view yesterday, today, appears in Ratecast tomorrow and the next day. So as Ratecast updates, it's really not directly related to rate view, but there is some correlation there. So Miles, like on on this particular lane, like we all know that Salinas uh, feeds the country, right? So um, in in the growing season, basically lasts during uh, all the the warm months. What does this look like for um, like that seasonal southeast produce? Yeah, so if we go back, you want to do like Miami to Atlanta, something like that. Yeah, love that. That's that that's that good lane. It usually kicks off what around like with like right around Mother's Day, right? That's where it, where it usually peaks, like flowers and stuff like that. We got flowers, we got, um, I forget, Dean's always really good about throwing out these random fruits that I hardly ever think about, <laughs> uh, like a hybrid of a cantaloupe, an heirloom tomato or things like that. But yes. I know so, you got all the oranges and citrus fruits for sure. We got a 27 cent jump week over week from the 20th to the 27th. And we can see that in the timeline really drastic right so andrew you talked about process how does something like this help with that change management you get a new rep that comes in and you say produce is coming but you don't really have a they've never sat in the seat they haven't felt it they you know they haven't been on the other end of that white knuckled um arguing with carriers um is this a tool that, that you use to kind of sit them and give them at least a perspective we do we, we do regular trainings around them too you know something that i heard from a lot of our reps earlier this year in their annual review was um spot quote confidence i'm not confident when i give a quote and um you know giving them this literal confidence band that you have here um has, has been an extremely valuable tool for them to look at um in addition to the load to truck ratios is, is another thing we put a lot of emphasis on when we look at it right hey maybe this is giving you a rate but it's got a high load to truck ratio <laughs> that rate may not matter right so go go out and try to get a truck in hand but when it comes to forecasting um this has been an incredibly valuable tool and, and the best uh, i think it's filled a void in the industry that we haven't had out there to put in front of people and the other thing i'd mention too is not only looking at the rate cast rate when you're pricing something but also working with your procurement team or your carrier sales team on today's buy rate because you might have a load on the board today that you took two weeks ago mm -hmm. and you should reevaluate your buy rate today versus what you thought it would have been two weeks ago especially yeah. in a changing market like we're in now that's such an incredible point and and this kind of gives you the confidence to do that as you mentioned um miles i i i, I don't mean to cut you short um we do have a little over 200 people on the call and there are there are some questions that are, that are coming in. I think we've got roughly eight, nine minutes left. Um, so Brad, uh, Josh Kimmerer had a question for you. Hi, Josh, been a minute. Um, I hope you're well, man. Uh, Brad, how do you weigh the different data points when compiling it all together? As an example, do you lean more on internal data versus ex external data? And do you adjust that depending upon the opportunity? Yeah, so I can't go into too detail on that because it is proprietary, but we do use, we do weigh our own data the heaviest. Um, and then depending on what type of freight it is and what uh, will depend on then what data after that is weighed next. So to give you an example, um, we weigh DAT differently than we would weigh um, truck stop if it was van versus flatbed. Uh, mm -hmm. We have other sources, you know, for Canada um, that we weigh differently than. And um, it's all, we determined how much we weigh that based on um, what we found the accuracy to be. And then after all that is done and is said and done, um, we then will put a, a confidence score on top of that to, based on how much data we have and what our confidence is, if that rate is accurate. 
Josh, I know you would have loved that confidence score. Um, I, I hope that uh, helps satisfy your answer, but what I heard is it depends, but yes. we'll make sure that, uh, that we give you a, a confidence score that um, so that you can uh, make that decision and um, be confident in it, um, as, as silly as that might sound. Uh, Andrew, this one's for you. Um, from a broker point of view, sales wants to rate every lane in the RFQ. Operations only wants to rate the strong and easy lanes. Uh, procurement while sales and operations are internal clients. How do you suggest moving forward these days to have a win-win for everyone? Do you suggest, for example, to price only lanes you have carriers for or price it all? You know, it's a very easy and a very complicated question at the same time. The easy answer is you need to know what your customer is looking for, right? So some customers, if you quote everything, they will contract everything. Um, but some customers will only contract the, the contract the top three or five or 10 lanes. If you're below that, you get kicked out, right? So it really comes down to, are you gonna be held responsible for committing to those rates, right? If they're only doing a primary, a secondary and a tertiary, quote everything, why not, right? But if they're not gonna let you spot quote anything you have a backup rate for, then yeah, absolutely be more selective and don't quote lanes that maybe you might do better off on the spot market. And so I really think it comes down to knowing what the customer is going to do with their contracting of what you quote. Mm -hmm. That's the easy answer. For a new customer who you don't know that answer for, it's a much more complicated question. The answer is probably somewhere in the middle. Maybe don't quote lanes that have more volatility. Um, I personally love the, the standard deviation uh, that comes down in the multi-lane. Um, that gives you a great idea what your variance or var is gonna be on a lane. If you're gonna have high variance, maybe that's not a lane you should be looking at contracting, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think taking those factors into play and maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle, maybe quote half or 20%. I think one thing I can tell you is I typically especially larger enterprise shippers, I don't want to be more than maybe five per 10% of their contract volume because right. if something goes wrong, I've shut down their operations and now that and now that the relationships is on a different footing than what it was if maybe I had 20 or 30 or 50 percent of their mm -hmm. volume. Yeah, and that, that kind of speaks to your point uh, earlier that you mentioned of, of scaling from a small company to a big company. Those personnel issues, like if you have a large chunk of a of a shipper's contractor volumes and, and you you lose your account manager, um, there's there's a lot that walks out with that, and you really put yourself in a in a tough situation. Um, Ryan McClure, uh, can you provide an actual target margin? You do not go below, or will that always be ever changing? Um, I'll try to take this one, and then Brad, you can tell me um, if I'm right or if I'm wrong, or if it's in line with what you do. Um, so, I think you need to pay attention to gross margin dollars per load, um, just as much as you do to your GM percent, because those at the end of the day are going to be what pays the bills. So, for instance, if you have a lane that uh, has six thousand dollars in cost and you put ten percent margin on that, probably going to be too high. Um, so, but six percent might might be closer to the market. Um, whereas if you've got a hundred mile run and, and it's a four hundred dollar truck. Um, 6% is is not going to uh, to pay for you to uh, to push the paper across uh, the the desk of everyone. So in that instance, maybe 20% or even 30% margin might be the right number for you. So I think it really comes down to the number of loads you're moving per day, um, what your uh, what your monthly nut needs to be, and can I cover that? And you back into that based upon your gross margin dollars per load, and then that can help you inform on your your margin strategy. Brad, how Eric, do you get if I could jump in there, oh, sorry. No, <laughs> um, so that I think it's important to look at is mileage bands or, or a revenue, right? If you're going to have a 2,000 mile run, uh, you're not going to have 18% margin on it, right? There's just, you're in a making a thousand, two thousand dollars a contract load. It's not going to happen. But on the contrary, you can't have 12% on a hundred mile run. You can't move loads making, you know, 80, 90, hundred dollars. So we look at mileage bands when we look at our margin percentage and we look at dollars dollars per load does that resonate with you brad it does um and, and i mean so we look at a couple different asset aspects of this right so 
Um, again, what is what is the goal of this customer? Is it to get into the door? I mean, there's times when we'll take a loss on a customer for a full year to get to the door with them because we see long-term growth. And in which case, you know, we'll we'll uh, price it very very aggressively. Uh, if it's an existing customer, what is the goal with that customer? Um, and in that case, typically we'll we'll try and keep that customer in between. So we 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 have a, a range internally that we try and keep a customer in between, mm-hmm. and um, we'll then look at it and say, is this customer within that range? And then for sure we use we use we look at it both in a percent amount as well as then a, a flat dollar amount. Yeah. Um, so hey, you Brad, know, if I it's a, a short. I have a question on that, not to cut you off, but um, when you're talking about getting an aggressive for, for a new customer, um, I think we can all think of the reasons why why you need to do that, um, but you have to almost kind of do it intelligently. Are you targeting specific lanes that you're going to get aggressive on, like specific characteristics? So like backhauls, low volatility lanes, like, could you talk about that? Yeah, so we for sure target specific lanes when we're going to take losses. We want to talk, okay. uh, target what's called, uh, I call them low risk lanes, right? Yep. So. Um, Intra-city lanes, so Dallas to Dallas, Dallas to Fort Worth, uh, intra-LA, you know, um, very, very low risk, uh, lots of carriers to run them, lots of NARP uh, that we can work with. And so we know exactly what our cost is going to be. And we can say, well, I'm willing to take a $50 loss in every single lane um, on that on that particular um, RFP to, to show them that, you know, we can do what we say we're going to do. Um, you know, we have we have obviously strong lanes for our in our in our individual company um, that others don't typically have. So outbound Idaho, inbound Idaho, we're very very strong at. You know, the, um, or even then, if that customer doesn't do Idaho, maybe they run you know outbound Jersey, where you know lower risk, um, lower volatility, and so we can go a little bit more aggressive uh, and minimize the losses. And still show that customer that you know we can service their freight, we can help them when they're in binds, we can do what we say we're going to do, and we're not going to go back on our loads. I, I think that's uh, fantastic. You guys uh, certainly operate with a lot of integrity over there. Um, Andrew, do you have any final thoughts? You know, I, I'm very excited about this tool to shamelessly plug once again. I think it's filled a gap that is not existed in the industry. I, I did see a question in here. Um, about the rate cast uh, rate being pulled in there. And um, I remember working to mirror very closely um, in, in the beta version of it. And uh, there's a lot of tools out there that um, it brings all the DAT tools and some gaps in the industry. It really closes and it, it allows an opportunity for everyone to be collaborative in one centralized UI. Um, I'm very excited about the tool and uh, I hope you guys check it out there at the, in San Diego. Yeah, and and your feedback makes these tools better, right? Like we build these things for you. Um, we don't build them because we think it's a great idea. Like we we're out there listening and we're trying to uh, to fill those gaps. Um, but I just wanted uh, to thank everybody. Um, there was a lot said today, Andrew, you and Brad. Um, you guys are fantastic. Um, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge here. Um, there was a question on are we going to do more of these webinars? The answer is yes, we will. Um, I'm sure Andrew and Brad will. Uh, We'll come back if uh, if if invited, or at least I hope so. Um, Miles, thank you so much for the uh, Raycast demo. Um, I, I I think well, like the way that that you approach that is is unique. Um, and and if you're out there considering Raycast, like give Miles a call um, because I, I I think he has a his thumb on on all of the benefits from it. So. Um, with that, I just want to thank everyone for your time, um, and I, I hope we uh, provided some value. And please uh, respond to the post-webinar survey. Um, it helps us understand what topics and what information you're looking for, and uh, hopefully we can continue to uh, to do these for you and keep help, helping you educate yourself and uh, run your businesses a little bit more efficiently. Yeah, thank, thank you for putting this together, Eric. Brad and Andrew, thank you for your time. And Feel free to shoot me an email. I'm pretty easy to find. So, you know, LinkedIn or email, happy to demo it for you as well. Yep. And Randy.